In this video, we're going to talk about acute otitis media. Derived from the Greek word ot, which means ear, itis, which means inflammation, and from Latin media, which is something pertaining to the middle. Acute otitis media is infection of the middle ear, and it is a very common problem in children. Now, the majority of children will be diagnosed with at least one episode of otitis media. The ear plays a key role in hearing. The ear is divided into three parts, the inner, middle, and outer ear. The basic physiology of the ear involves sound waves hitting and vibrating the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane moves the three small bones of the middle ear, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The movement of the stapes causes the fluid in the cochlea to vibrate. The cochlear cells will translate this vibration uh, information into nerve impulses and essentially send it to the brain where sound is perceived. The eustachian tube is the connection between the middle ear and the nasopharynx or the nasal cavity. The middle ear cleft is made up of the mastoid air cells posterior to the middle ear cavity, the eustachian tube and the nasopharynx. The middle ear cleft can be thought of as a miniature lung. These areas involved allow for ventilation and pressure equalization. And issues and any issues that occur within these areas can result in middle ear pathologies. The eustachian tube is a pretty important structure and serves many roles. It permits equilibration of middle ear pressure with atmospheric pressure. It's the primary defense mechanism of the middle ear. It protects the middle ear from reflux of nasopharyngeal secretions through the use of cilia propelling unwanted substances to the nasopharynx. And thirdly, it drains secretions from the middle ear into the nasopharynx because of the angle. Acute otitis media mainly occurs in children and is a result of eustachian tube dysfunction. If the eustachian tube does not work, otitis media can develop. For example, infection or a reaction in the middle uh, ear cleft can result in edema, swelling of the eustachian tube. Similarly, adenoid hypertrophy from an infection can block eustachian tube drainage and disrupt pressure equalization resulting in negative pressure in the middle ear. Another cause of eustachian tube dysfunction is failure of some of the muscles that connect or wrap around or pass through the eustachian tube. This includes failing of the tensor veli palatini and levator veli palatini. These muscles help in opening the eustachian tube, but are primarily used and involved in swallowing and yawning. Otitis media is more common in children, precisely because of the anatomical differences of the eustachian tube between children and adults. Unlike adults' eustachian tube, the child's eustachian tube is more shorter, more horizontally aligned, it's softer and has a smaller passageway. And all this allows for easier spreading of infection from the nasopharynx into the middle ear. The pathophysiology of acute otitis media follows a few stages. One thing that people are often confused about is all the terminology used in otitis media, such as otitis media with effusion, acute otitis media, superative otitis media, etc. So hopefully understanding the pathophysiology and going step by step can help clear this off. So let's begin with a viral upper respiratory tract infection that has happened for a few days. This eventually causes congestion and swelling of the nasal mucosa the nasopharynx, and swelling of the eustachian tube. Eustachian tube occlusion results in increased negative pressure in the middle ear and accumulation of middle ear secretions. Secondary bacterial or viral infections can occur in this environment, which will cause further superation and features of acute otitis media. Remember, 
Acute otitis media is a bacterial or a viral infection of the middle ear. However, in this closed environment, like what we uh, discussed, certain bacteria thrive. The main causative bacterial agents in acute otitis media are streptococcus pneumoniae, non-typable Haemophilus influenza, and Morexella catarralis. If the pressure becomes too great in the middle ear because of fluid building up, the tympanic membrane can perforate. This is called superative otitis media. Superative otitis media is characterized by ear discharge, termed otorrhea. Superative otitis media can become chronic, and thus is termed chronic superative otitis media. Sometimes it resolves, and the perforated membrane heals and returns to a new baseline. If the inflammation in the middle ear settles, there is resolution of symptoms usually. However, there is often residual fluid in the middle ear cavity. Residual fluid in the middle ear cavity after acute otitis media is termed otitis media with effusion. Otitis media with effusion is usually asymptomatic and resolves by itself after three months without doing anything. Unfortunately, even though otitis media with effusion is asymptomatic, it is still a potential uh, environment for a reinfection, and this can thus cause recurrent acute otitis media. So let's look at a summary diagram of acute otitis media. Now, taking all the pathophysiology into context, acute otitis media classically presents with otalgia, ear pain, pyrexia, fevers, hearing loss, and otorrhea through the perforation of the tympanic membrane. Other symptoms in children include irritability, reduced appetite, upper respiratory tract infections, and fatigue. Otitis media with effusion is usually asymptomatic, as uh, explained previously, and typically follows an episode of acute otitis media. Hearing loss is the other main complaint. Hearing loss occurs because the tympanic membrane and auditory ossicles are unable to move as effectively in an environment full of fluid and inflammation. Hence, in the presence of an infusion, there can be a conductive hearing loss rather than a sensory neural hearing loss. Diagnosis of acute otitis media and otitis media with effusion can be diagnosed by direct visualization of the tympanic membrane with an otoscope or a pneumatic otoscope. In acute otitis media, the eardrum looks inflamed injections of the vessels of the tympanic membrane to reddening with bulging of uh, the eardrum is present. Using a pneumatic otoscope, there is limited or absent mobility of the membrane. Here is an image of an otoscope uh, visualization of someone who has acute otitis media. Note the bulging eardrum and the blood vessels. If there is perforation of the eardrum with discharge, this is termed superative otitis media. Here is an image through an otoscope of someone with a superative acute otitis media. Note the discharge that is coming out. Once diagnosis of acute otitis media is suspected, a period of observation is recommended. Typically 24 to 48 hours is recommended. Exceptions exist for high-risk groups and persistent infections. The overuse of antibiotics may contribute to increasing antimicrobial resistance. Pain and fever in acute otitis media should be controlled with paracetamol or ibuprofen. If symptoms do not improve with analgesia after 48 hours, then a course of antibiotics is commenced. Typically, this is amoxicillin. Decongestions and antihistamines are not beneficial in the treatment of acute otitis media. When acute otitis media resolves, it then really becomes otitis media with effusion, usually. In otitis media with effusion, uh, otoscopic findings include visualization of air fluid levels with bulging and uh, maybe decreased mobility of the tympanic membrane. There is no evidence of a red, sore eardrum. Here is an image uh, of an otoscope uh, visualization of someone who has otitis media with effusion. Note the fluid behind the tympanic membrane. 
Recurrent otitis media or persistent otitis media with effusion may require ventilation tubes, um, known as tympanostomy tubes, especially if the child has features of hearing loss, developmental delays, or learning difficulties. It is also important to follow up on the child after episodes of an acute otitis media and to tell the parents to return if symptoms worsen, as this could be signs of complications associated with acute otitis media. Rare complications of acute otitis media can be divided into extracranial and intracranial complications. Most of the complications of acute otitis media is a result of direct extension of the infection, the pus, to the mastoid air cells, which are situated behind the posterior wall of the middle ear cavity, basically. Extension into the mastoid air cells causes mastoiditis. Other complications of acute otitis media can include intracranial abscesses, including subdural abscess uh, and subarachnoid abscess. There can also be subperiosteal abscesses. Facial nerve palsy can be also a complication, as well as labyrinthitis. A more comprehensive video on the complications of acute otitis media and mastoiditis will be available. Adults can also present with acute otitis media and treatment is roughly the same. Remember, acute otitis media is a very common problem in children. The majority of children will be diagnosed with at least one episode of otitis media. Management actually relies on a period of observation first typically 24 to 48 hours before commencing antibiotics. Thank you for watching.